so for this video I want to talk about um, Blender materials, the material nodes in particular, and how to construct these types of material effects, and then how to get those material effects to uh, alternate sources like Unity or some other WebGL type of uh, game engine, because all of these materials are basically created with um, procedural nodes in Blender, in Blender's node editor, and um, none of them will import and look the same in uh, a game engine or uh, on the web, unless you do a little work to get there. But first, let's talk about um, these materials and how they're created. So basically, I'm gonna go down the list of like slowly introducing nodes and showing you how to create these different um, materials using uh, the different nodes on the principal BSDF and then some other things that you'll have to do uh, using other nodes in order to create some of these effects. So uh, let's just go down the list here. So I'm going to hide. Um, and let me turn on my screencast keys. And I will hide all of these except for this first one. Then we'll take our um, monkey and just show that effect. So we'll just change the to plastic. And then we'll go into um, node editor. So, or shading, however you like to refer to it. By nodes, we just mean these um, procedural nodes that are generated and that you can add to build up a node structure. So what this is, is um, it's just uh, kind of a plastic base node. You have this material output and this um, principled BSD of shader. Uh, principled just means it's a physically kind of, it's based on the idea of creating physically accurate materials. Uh, it was, uh, if you want to read up on the concept, it started with Disney and uh, Blender's shader kind of mimics what Biz, uh, Disney had in some of their movies for their shading. So you have this base color texture and that's what we're messing with here. So if we want to change, we can just go and add these colors. Um, and then to create this kind of plastic rubber effect, all we have to do is go and play with roughness. So you can create shiny plastic and extremely rough kind of uh, rubbery uh, plastic. And that's pretty much it for this material. Um, the thing to notice though, is that depending on what your setting is, um, when I create this, uh, take the roughness down to zero, it makes it completely shiny, so you get this specular reflection. However, um, I'm in material uh, shading node, or viewport shading here. Um, without these checked, um, you'll still get that option, but you're getting it from uh, this matte cap material, so that when I change these out, I get different effects. However, they don't render. Let me just change my view to show you the um, yeah, lock camera to view. So when I render this, it's not going um, uh, because I have the lights turned on. It's not going to look the same as the uh, frame that I just rendered because this matte cap does not render, the environment renders. So um, in, by default, if you don't have your environment set up, and let me just show you that, Let's go to the world. If you don't have a, a texture image on this background node, it'll just look gray. So if I turn on scene world and then scene lights, I get this effect. Um, but if I turn off the light, Notice I still have some shading here, and that's because this, uh, by default, this will be set to one. And you're gonna have this slightly gray uh, texture that's gonna create some ambient lighting. 
So in order to um, get an environment that will render, so if I go, let me just show you. This is the default that you would see without any lights. Um, if I render this, I'm still getting my environment because it's set to render. Um, it's because I've already set up this scene, but uh, normally this is, especially in Eevee, this is what you will see, this gray background. And you can change that to some other color, and that's going to impart that color as a kind of an ambient light. If you want to fix that, you can just, uh, using Node Wrangler, click on this, and it'll insert this um, equirectangular image. And then if you go and find like an HDR image and plug that into the color, you get this environment, uh, which when Scene World is turned on, will show up in the background and impart its own light. So uh, that's how you can get these reflections set up. Let me uh, turn that off. Um, and then on top of that, you can actually rotate the uh, environment around the object. Uh, in Eevee, this environment will not cast shadows, but in uh, Cycles it will. So something to be aware of depending on what your render output is. And that's pretty much setting up a plastic shader for uh, Eevee. Notice that when I wanted to change the world or create these environments, I just pulled down on the, in the uh, shader editor to world. Now I can go back to object. And this is my uh, plastic. Notice that I, when I selected this uh, floor, I had a different shader uh, set up. And basically it's just this um, checkered texture where I'm also inserting kind of a um, bevel or bump in the um, in between the tiles to create kind of a bit of a uh, a bump here using the normal map in this uh, brick texture set to this uh, half the scale of the checkered texture and that'll create um, a highlight when I turn yeah I've got scene lights turned on it's really thin you can see there's a little bit of a bevel there so uh, we'll get into how these work in a minute but these are just two extra nodes there's a checker texture and then there's this uh, brick texture we'll talk about that with some of these others so let's move on to the next material so let me hide my blue plastic and turn on this wooden object and then I'll set Texture to wood. Hmm. Where is it? Here we are. So notice it maps a little weird. That's just because the UV mapping on this shader. Let me hide this. The UV mapping on this shader is um, right now set to um, the, this texture is coming in at the default you look yeah everything is uh, set for UV so it's using her UV maps um, as they're applied and by UV maps I mean under UV editor these so this is how it's wrapping um, let's go to shading what we can do, however, is we can modify that so that it changes across the object. And it may look a little weird depending on what we use, but let me just show you that. So using this um, wooden texture, which um, I got from a textures folder, this is one of the few materials that I'm actually using uh, a preset or pre-rendered image to shade with. And what I'm doing is I'm taking this um, image of wood and splitting it out to uh, get different uh, RGB channels then remapping those channels using color ramps and then plugging those back in um, for bump maps or for roughness so if you ever want to see the output like what you're getting here so if I get this blue to the surface 
this is what I'm taking and modifying. And then after I run it through this color ramp, which is kind of like a levels in Photoshop, um, then I get this. So I've modified it and I'm running that into the roughness channel where um, light will be rougher and dark will be less rough. So I've, what I've done is I've kind of inverted the color here by flipping black to uh, this side and then white to this side. Normally it would be the opposite. So let me just show you how that would look if I swapped it. So that's what I'd get if I ran it that way, but instead I'm doing that. And that is what creates this um, roughness effect. Let me just show you. I'll take off the color. And I will also take off the bump so that you can see that um, there's still a kind of effect where some of the material is more specular. You can kind of see it against the sun. Some of the material is more specular than the other, and that's the roughness, and that's what can kind of controls. Um, it's a it's a nice effect. It's very subtle. You can see it better on the sphere, where um, the slats. Um, what I've done is assume that like dust or something would kind of collect under the slats, and then in the grooves, and then the stuff that is um, higher up or um, more exposed would be kind of polished smooth by rubbing or um, something like that. So that creates a difference in the shininess of the material. And then from that, I take uh, another channel, in this case the green channel, which looks like this, and then run that through this ramp, a color ramp, which then looks like this. So I make it darker, and then from that I run it into a bump uh, node to create uh, a normal map, which will um, change the way light bounces on the object. And, and then I'm also taking, since there was already a normal map associated with the same wood, I'm, I'm kind of mixing the two here. So this was an actual texture-based normal map, which looks like this. I take them and um, run them into, so I get the same outputs, and then I'm mixing them, the RGB values, to kind of get a little bit more of the grain of the wood mixed in with the slats to get this mix. And then I can pump that into the normal. And with the roughness, I get a bump as well that'll kind of, it doesn't cast shadows, but it does respond to the direction of the light. And that creates part of the material. And then from there, I take the um, actual wood texture which looks like this, which is pretty light. It doesn't have much red uh, to it. It's kind of a weathered wood, perhaps. I'm running that through a color ramp and then taking that color ramp and just adding some extra, uh, remapping this, the darks and lights of this, to different color values to create um, this. And that looks more wood-like to me. So it's just that I've added some more brown to it. So it's a little less weathered. And then I can run that into the base color. And then reconnect my output here. And all of them combined create this um, wood that will light based on its uh, roughness. It's a pretty subtle effect, but... And you can always go and change, like especially on the roughness, you can look, find the edge of the lighting here. Make sure I'm looking at, yeah. Find the lighting and shift things using this color ramp to punch things up. So really we need to go this way. So that can make it shinier but then have um, less, or I could go back and flip the opposite way. 
and make it so that the stuff that's more exposed um, is shinier or more in this case more um, the stuff that's hidden away like what's under this crack so like it might still have the enamel then and then the stuff that's exposed would be um, that sticks out would be less so or uh, rougher so it's up to you how you want to set that up and, my, and it kind of depends on what you're doing so weathered really old weather wood would probably be pretty rough anyway but um, you can get some pretty nice effects in terms of lighting this way so that's how all of that works notice that color ramps are a very useful node especially when you can split off from an image because we're getting for really all intents and purposes um, all intents and purposes sorry um, I don't need this uh, other normal map. I could run this straight in as it, as it is and still get a normal map that I've pulled um, from the original texture right here. Just one texture to control all of these different inputs using the RGB values. And uh, it looks pretty good. So... Um, I just felt like I wanted to mix this in, but actually, to be honest, I'm going to make it more efficient. Just delete these um, so that it does use that one texture to control everything because I kind of like that effect. Um, so anyway, that's the wood. And basically, I like to, when I'm playing around with these textures, I like to... Um, do it on flat surfaces and round surfaces to check the effect across the board and make sure that everything looks good. Um, and then maybe do a UV mapped surface to see what I deal with there. Um, so like I said, I want to I want if I want to change how this thing gets mapped uh, using Node Wrangler, I can just select the texture and hit Control T, and that'll insert a node. And notice that it is pulling from the UV map on this object um, but I can play with these and change that so I can turn it to generated and it's going to give me a different type of mapping that um, doesn't have any seams sort of projects through the entire object it can be kind of cool uh, and this can be super useful for certain other effects that we'll get into later you can do normal which will do it from a projected normal on the object. It can kind of look cool, but the thing about normal is on cubes uh, doesn't really work very well. <laughs> on flat surfaces, it doesn't really work. It works okay on uh, curved surfaces, but um, you're not going to get the effect that you want from uh, on a cube. And then we've looked at UV, and then there's Object, which is similar to Generated, but a little bit different. So look at the difference between the two. It's kind of actually interesting. And notice that Object looks different. It's kind of projecting through. Um, it's only really projecting straight down onto the top, but it goes, it streaks across the edges based on the pixels that are there. And then if we look at camera, another useful way of projecting, it's interesting because what's going to happen is it's going to project based on the camera input. Notice that it shifts as you move the object around. Uh, and by camera, I don't mean this view window, I mean this. That's what's getting projected from this camera. However, um, so that camera kind of locks it into position. Um, and then if you do window, you get the same thing, but projected from this window view, whichever window you're in. And you can see where... Um, <laughs> You're like, well, that's moving or it shifts every time the camera moves. It's like it's not really that useful. But the thing is, uh, some effects, some non-photorealistic rendering effects, it actually may be very useful, sort of like creating a 
halftone dot pattern on a tune shader or something like that, where um, the object will move and that, that texture doesn't need to be married to the object. You want it to shift based on the lighting. And then there's reflection, which is basically like saying I've created this material and I want to project it as if it's projecting from a uh, like a mirror or a spherical surface around the object. And you can see it sort of looks metallic. Uh, so it's like the object is reflecting this wooden sh texture across the entire object. You can create some kind of interesting effects with that, um, especially on round surfaces. But generally, you're going to be working with UV or object or generated for the most part. But just, re just notice that all of these have their purposes in terms of making different effects, and we'll go into some other materials that use different versions of this to do, to do different things. So let's go back to, uh, let's just use UV for this one, since that's what it should be, so that you can control how it maps across the object. And I'll save. All right, so let's look at the next material, which is metal. All right, um, let me set her material to metal. All right, so metal is pretty easy to create. Um, notice there's no extra nodes. All I've done is gone and just uh, gone from this plasticky material to crank up the metallic, and then you get metal. And then the roughness controls how shiny or reflective it is versus how rough. So in some ways, going completely rough on a metal um, has an effect, more like a velvet sort of. But um, it's not really, it's going to kind of hide the, the metalness of it. On top of that, you've got these two features right here, anis anisotropic and uh, anisotropic rotation. Those will not show up in Eevee. It's basically how the specular highlight, this uh, reflected kind of, well, it's easier to see on a sphere. Um, and we'll change the roughness a little bit. So this anisotropic highlight um, will streak across the object, kind of like brushed metal or uh, pots and pans, things like that. Uh, in order to render it, though, you have to show it. You have to render it in cycles because uh, right now anisotropic reflections don't work in Eevee. So just real quick um, to show you what the effect looks like, uh, since I have it cranked up and turned on. Oh, the other thing to know is that these rotations, it's like 360 degrees, but it's on a scale from zero to one. So that means that uh, right now it'll start horizontal and most of them would be vertical. So 2.5, 0.25 is like 90 degree angle. And then 0.5 would be rotated the opposite. So it's rotating the spec. So I'm gonna leave it at like 0.25 and we'll turn on cycles and real quick in uh, shaded mode now you see how this spec um, kind of rolls across the object and you'll only notice it for the most part with the, with the roughness of the object it'll streak it uh, vertically you can kind of see it um, across the top of here. Let's see. Um, notice that as I move, it's changing the um, direction of the uh, anisotropic spec. So there's a good effect. There, it gives you the effect. It's kind of spreading it and link, lengthening it across. So anyway, that's um, anisotropic metal reflections. Um, you can use, and they're very specific in terms of what you want to use them for. So um, that's metal. Now, as far as metal goes, there's lots of things. Obviously, we could um, punch into these texture channels in order to change this basic uh, Christmas ornament effect to make it something a little bit more interesting. So let's talk about how to use textures create um, 
weathered metal. So in this case, I'm going to do sort of an ancient bronze or aged bronze. <clears throat> the idea here is that um, I don't want. I didn't. I could have used better um, control textures, but I'm still trying to keep it procedural. Um, so I created a uh, brick texture and then kind of a weathered um, rough noise and used that to create the um, pits that um, for this aged metal and then created kind of a patina color and mixed it in on the side. So you get this weathered um, aging effect. It's not very photorealistic. Um, I'm really only using a bump here so it's not there's nothing super special about it but it does show how uh, in this case you can use materials um, or textures on your material nodes to create this. Now what I've also done is I've created a group so that I can create these group inputs and be able to actually change this stuff so normally when you add, and I've just clicked into the group, here's all the nodes that I've added. This is the output right here. It comes out of that node. And then there's a couple of input nodes like this, this one, and I think this one. So what I've gone and done, this looks like spaghetti, uh, but I've got some texture coordinates. Notice I'm using the object um, texture coordinate going into this vector. And then I've got this Musgrave texture, which looks like um, a kind of <clears throat> noise. I'll go outside in a second and show you these uh, textures. And then I take that Musgrave texture, which just kind of comes across kind of white and gray, and then I remap it using a color ramp. Here I'm taking an RGB mixer and taking a, this brick texture and combining the two in order to create this um, pitted it's basically a grayscale image, but it's creating this pitted uh, effect because I'm running that into a bump and then taking the output of it as well and running it into a rough uh, roughness and metal effect so that um, the lights and darks control how metallic or reflective the areas are and the um, pits will contain sort of this patina color, which I map up here coming from another Musgrave texture and mixing those going into a, nor a color channel with some color inputs um, coming from my input node here. So the effect is that if I change this I can make it more yellow, green, whatever, copper, just have to remember the colors of your uh, materials. And then you can change the damage amount or size. Create bigger chunks. Um, kind of damage smoothness. This is kind of like pitting where I put a lot more damage, kind of a rougher material the brick scale and then the mortar thickness which is really sensitive I should have controlled that a little bit differently basically it's in the uh, point O range There we go. Um, and then the edge depth, it's the edge or the actual shape of the bricks. Um, so that's all of the channels. And by grouping it here, it basically gives me the ability then to modify these um, options over here in the material um, tab. Because if I don't, if I just left this ungrouped and had all that stuff. I have to go into each individual setting and toggle it. Instead, this exposes it as kind of a, a global attribute that I can adjust um, to uh, play with. So that's kind of a really, really ancient weathered brick metal. Um, and notice that, uh, oops, notice that. 
Uh, I'm still getting the UV mapping because one of my inputs must use a UV map, but uh, I could I could set up a control for that and be able to toggle it as well. Let's talk about car paint or metal fleck, which is a pretty fun material to make and it has a nice effect too. So let me change the surface. So what I've got here is um, a metal paint that should have uh, kind of a Fresnel effect that goes to purple coming from this color channel. And then I've got all of these metal flecks in, inside um, to create kind of differences in the metal. And there's like this notion of a paint, which is the red. Um, so I'm creating this sort of effect. And then on top of that, I'm adding this uh, clear coat. So the clear coat, if I just do without the clear coat, um, then you just get this kind of like pebbled metallic diff variation in the surface. And there's no, because it's all kind of rough, there's, there's uh, no kind of lacquer across the top. So the clear coat will add a secondary shine to it that's almost like it's a um, got a, a clear coat paint on top of the uh, metal fleck paint that's under. And then on top of that, um, I could create a secondary kind of color effect on the, on the edge like you'll see in some paint jobs where if I go and I select these and crank up the purpleness it's it's on the edge so you'll notice that on the edge it's a little more purple than this straight on and that's just me uh, taking and mapping um, different uh, values of the Fresnel effect and by Fresnel I mean um, here's a Fresnel node this, let me just drag this and show you what that looks like. For now, is basically edge lighting on an object, and then I can use that and color ramps to create mask so that I can basically layer things however I like, um, and then punch the, use that as a factor to control how the materials mix. And that's what I'm doing with this red and purple car paint. Um, effect so it's reddish straight on but on the edge it goes more purple and then from that I can go and change um, the color to whatever color effect I want so if I want to make it green on the edge that gives you kind of a more of an idea of how it's working uh, you can create those two-toned paint job effects on cars uh, so that's how that works and then you can punch it up even more Go back and do more purple or more blue. Yeah, it gives you a better. You can really see it on the cube and the sphere. It's a little more subtle on her. All right, so anyway, that's uh, kind of metal fleck. And you can, again, color ramps do most of the work. Um, and the Fresnel is, is another super useful node. Uh, the other thing that we're using is this RGB mix node where we're combining materials using different effects to um, create this metal fleck. I'm using noises and then just uh, creating dot patterns, really small dot patterns, and then mixing those together to create this um, breakup in the roughness or the metallic nature uh, in the actual paint, and then layering the... Um, clear coat on top of it. So that's how that works. I'm going to put all these up online on a GitHub uh, where I have all my other Blender tutorial stuff and you'll be able to download these and take them apart and look at them. So now let's talk about subsurface. And this is still all using the principle so um, it's pretty cool that you can get away and do all this stuff uh, using one shader. So I've created this candle wax 
um, to show what subsurface does. Again, notice there's no uh, texture inputs because basically I'm just playing with this um, subsurface control. Sometimes it's hard to see what's going on if you're looking at it in the shader editor. So what I'm going to do is go to, for this one, I'm, I'm going to go into modeling, um, object mode, I'll focus by F. And it's, it can be hard to see how this looks unless um, you're doing it kind of at, uh, <coughs> in the dark. So we're on Eevee. Um, subsurface scattering uh, is always on, but what I've done, done is I've gone and cranked it up. It's normally at 7, so I'm going to crank that down to show you what this does. And I'm going to turn off the environment basically in the world I'm just going to crank all oh, that's part of the reason why it's so bright is that um, I've got this world environment cranked up so I wanted that at three you can start to sort of see the effect but even then still too bright and I need to turn on my light and that's subsurface right there subsurface scattering so basically this is the effect that will get you semi-translucent objects including skin, milk, um, honey, well honey's pretty transparent, candle wax, um, jade, and I'm going to show you jade in a minute. But um, what I've done is I've gone, these are kind of overdriven. Um, if I look at the material, notice that the base color is set to red. That's contributing nothing because I've got full subsurface going. If I go somewhere in between the two, notice the subsurface goes down and more of the red comes in. So you can kind of mix the base color and the subsurface a little bit. However, I like to crank this up um, when I'm showing what it's doing because basically what happens is, is to create this subsurface effect, depending on the material, the subsurface color, this, um, light will go through or penetrate into the object at different depths and that's what these are so this is the red red light this is the green light and this is the blue light and what I'm doing is saying it's passing like this cube is um, two meters um, about two meters I believe and um, so the red is going through to two meters so it goes all the way through if I make that four double it you're going to make this whole thing go more red because basically more red light is getting through the object okay so I'm going to take that back to two if I do the opposite with green then more green light gets through and if I do it with um, blue more blue light so basically you can control the color of the object the object can be totally white. You can control the color of the object somewhat with um, just by doing changing the values of these and how they pass through. And it is based on size. So um, whatever size your object is, you have to kind of play around with these settings uh, to get it to do correctly or to uh, show the light correctly. So now I've just taken the red and almost made it so it doesn't pass through, and I'm getting a green and blue, mostly blue, uh, coming through. Because it's like one's at point, the red's at point two, but these are at two meters. So if I go to point two on the green, now blue is almost all that's coming through. And I can tone that down, but notice that as I start to take that down, um, the thing gets darker because only it's only getting through some of the object. And you can basically tell the thickness of the walls here by when they start to go dark. Like this is a hollowed out point. Um, so point five. So basically, these walls are less than 0.5 meters thick, uh, and I'm just getting this subsurface effect coming through on the edges now. Okay, uh, but what you'll notice is it's coming through the ears, and this is where you'll see like the edges of objects and across the sides of surfaces is where you're going to notice this effect the most. Um, so like uh, in in a human uh, if a light, if they're backlit, you're going to get this subsurface light coming through depending on the thickness of the ear, and you can control that amount. So if I wanted to make um, her look more skin toned, 
I can basically punch up the red and then take these way down. Yeah, that's too much punch on the red. So let's go 0.3. And then this could be like 0 0.07 for the green. And then the blue will be even less, 0 0.05. Uh, and then from there you can start to crank it up a little bit, but notice that that started almost already kind of create this um, skin tone effect, which you can punch up a little bit by adding just a tone to it, skinnish tone. Uh, it's too much red, so let's to fake it. I'm gonna just show you how to take it to skin. So let's do like one. I like to start with a nice round number, like one that gives me lots of light penetration and figure out the ratios from that. So this would be like 0 0.5, a little more brown, and then 0 0.3. And from there you kind of work out the differences and just crank them up a little bit. So maybe I want more or less. I want it to be more red. And then the blue can come down so that it goes red-orange to get that kind of um, reddish year effect. That makes it more yellow, that makes it more red. So you can kind of tweak it from there and find your ratios and then from there figure, you know, just scale them um, based on uh, the size of your object and how far you want the light to pass through. One other thing though is that you'll notice it's really rough looking. I'm in EV mode right now, or EV rendering, and you can see these lines. That's that setting that I cranked down in the render settings here. That's at 7. So if I make it 32, which is the max again, it smooths it out. Uh, so you can kind of see how it's sort of creating these render layers. Um, as I scale them down, you can see what it's doing. It's creating these render layers that are just like subdividing and kind of creating a gradient across the object and 32 is the max so it smooths it out to the point where you can see through it. Um, oh and the other thing you need to do is if you notice the material in order to get this by default you're not going to get at least in Eevee you're not going to get this um, light pass through you'll get the bleeding around the edge like that which also looks um, so that is like subsurface, but you also want this like translucency where light will actually go through the surface Because um, notice that her ear looks opaque. It's only going to show on the sides or around the edge uh, And you want that translucency to allow light to pass through in order to do that under the material settings You have to turn on subsurface translucency And that's what allows the light to go through the object Okay, so when we turn this back, uh, the world, crank it up a little bit, we get much more of that kind of chicken skin look um, based on the colors in this uh, setting that we've set up. The other thing that will add to it is how, um, depending on the color, a bump like a skin bump would add a lot more, but it's also super shiny right now. Um, so you could basically crank up the roughness to create a kind of more rubbery skin tone. This is kind of a plastic skin. Uh, a bump with some roughness control would, would add a lot to the effect to create that skin effect, okay? Or candle wax or whatever. You just have to figure out like what are you, what's the um, material you're trying to uh, simulate. All right, let's talk about jade. So jade is another um, subsurface material, but it also has these kind of uh, variations in the uh, amount of subsurface. So let me make e uh, EV. The let's see. Oh, material. Not that one. J 
save and um, let me just make, make sure I'm set there okay so you can see that the color of the subsurface effect is changing here it looks like it's a little bit different kind of marbly and to get that effect for the jade uh, let me show you in shading look at it from this view so we can see the back lining um, basically I just created a um, texture coordinate using the object now if we change that we could use the UV but when we do that we're going to get a seam across the back of her head because of the UV so if we do generated we'll get a different effect with no seam but you may have to scale things a little bit differently and this is why I like to use the cube and the sphere so you get the effect on top of that I'm doing some rotation to um, change the or the um, kind of grain I guess of this jade and you can shift it in position and scale rotation so you can make it a lot finer which is starts to make it look less real um, so you got to you got to get the scale just right And then from there, I'm taking this noise. I'm using that as a control on this noise texture, which has some distortion to create that kind of waviness. And then I'm taking that factor as a color, the noise factor, and adjusting it to create more, uh, less kind of even tones. Notice that if I crank it up, I can change the graininess. And then I'm running the actual color there and running that into not my base color, but my subsurface color. And also taking a different color ramp out of that noise and using that as the subsurface control, which will be how much subsurface uh, actually gets affected. So by adjusting this, I'm going to, right now, none. So notice that um, I've, I've swapped out the colors where now the light is passing more, or uh, the light is occluding more and has less subsurface. And the um, dark has more. And then this way, it's the other way around, where the light sort of scatters the uh, light passing through more and the dark doesn't and you could probably there's probably more to the jade than this like you'd probably want to add some transmission but I kind of want to just sort of show you that you could get away with a lot just by doing uh, just this um, and playing around with these color ramps to uh, control the effects And that's just going into the subsurface. And then if you look at the subsurface radius, I'm allowing um, one on the red, three on the green, two on the blue. And you can basically just tweak that. So if you go down on the blue, you get more of a green, a yellowish green. If you go up, you get more of a blue green. Um, and Jade's got mixes of all of, all of that in between. So anyway. Um, that's the, um, that's Jade, and let's go and look at the next material, which starts to get into glass. Now glass in EV is a little tricky. Um, Basically, it's a fake in Eevee. Um, let me find glass. Uh, that's smoked glass. We're going to talk about that in a minute. 
solid glass. Okay, so again, I'm back to just the material itself. Um, I've got specular cranked up a little bit, and notice that there's some refraction going on in the object. Uh, I've got, let's look at it over here actually. My specular's cranked up to 0.725, that's just the cho your choice. I've got the roughness down so that it's reflective. And I have an index of refraction, so transparent materials will have different vari uh, different levels of uh, indexes of refraction. I think air is, z is considered one, and or roughly around one, depending on the moisture in the air. And then, um, like water or glass like is around 1.3 1.4 going up to diamond which is up in the twos so uh, it's just how much light bends on these objects and if you wanted to create some other effects you can duplicate and um, do a red green blue split so that you get different different indexes of refraction and then you'll start to get some color fringing around the, the effect but the main effect here is this transmission. So if I take that down, it's not transparent. And if I crank it up, it is. And then anything in between. If I wanted to make the effect rougher or make it more like it's a pebbled glass, I can use this transmission roughness to blur um, the effect. But it's not really doing any of that right now or scatter the light perhaps, but maybe it's this roughness. Yeah, it's weird, this rough, uh, so the roughness affects the surface. And I'm guessing the transmission roughness will affect the um, refraction, because notice that it's a lot roughing the surface, but then you get this smooth refraction up here in terms of the light and the sky. And then the transmission roughness should blur that more. So they may play together, I don't know. Um, so that's how you can kind of like make for um, kind of more occluded glass, I guess. Um, yeah, you can see the occlusion going through. And then the last trick with this, and this is where it gets complicated, is um, in the way the refraction occurs. So right now, if I just do this, this is the effect. By default, you're not going to have this screen space refraction turned on. In fact, if you're an Eevee, you're not even going to have refraction turned on. So if we turn that off... Uh, which seems to have changed. I'm not sure what's going on, like in 2.82, which is what I'm using. Um, if you turn off screen space reflections, everything, like it's still doing all of this, which is weird because in the previous versions, this is how you would control refraction, but it seems to have been totally replaced or something uh, and have no effect now. So I don't know if that's a bug or if it's something that just got disconnected. Um, but you see, you still get some something like refraction, but it's as if it's just projecting through the object and there's no back faces. Um, looking at the material, if we turn off back face culling, nothing happens. Uh, alpha blend usually is set to opaque. So now you get a little bit more of the effect. Everything's reversing. Um, it's very confusing because like this was not the case before like you could turn toggle these things and uh, it would totally change the effect but now it's like things have changed in 2.82 I'm not quite sure how but the thing to understand is that um, this is your default effect that you're looking at right now and if you turn on screen space refraction notice that it changes and you get this sort of light bending refraction through. Uh, brightens it up a bit. Let's look at it from the other side and see what happens. So it's really dark here. And it's refract refracting the background. 
when we turn on the screen space refraction, then we get something sort of more like what we would expect. On top of that, there's this refraction depth, which is affected. So let's do, if we turn that up, it's, um, it darkens the whole thing. See there? By cranking that up past to something be beyond zero, we suddenly get um, this dark refraction. It's like a darker glass. Um, and if we turn on screen space refraction, then we get brightness as well. And if we turn down the transmission roughness, does anything happen? Nope. So it's very strange, uh, the effect. I'm not sure exactly. It's like light scattering, but it's it's additive. It's like it's um, it's additive, which works for you know looking at glass with a dark background because that looks more realistic to a degree um, versus that where it's just dark. I mean that could be dark green glass I guess but it's so dark it's hard to tell um, and then that's you know the default without any kind of depth or refraction depth in the screen face screen based refraction so having some depth definitely helps in that and if you notice as I crank up the depth it warps the objects in through that are being refracted through a little bit more with the screen space refraction turned on. If I take my blend mode, and this is something we'll see more in the next example, but if I take the blend mode and look at it, set it to alpha blend, nothing seems to happen, but um, I get this option for back face culling. Notice that these those transparent objects in the background are not uh, showing through here. And that's because um, I've got back face calling uh, checked. And let's look at it this way. Um, cranking up that does not help. Uh, show back face is not checked. But if I show that, I get this weird artifact. Um, except if I turn off back face culling, it comes back. So um, showing back face is really more for um, certain object conditions, like having a hollow glass object. Uh, and then this back face culling can help clean that up. But in this case, because of the way this thing is set up and I'm not um, hollowed it out, so you can see where you can see these ears through Evie or through um, Suzanne here, um, which is not right. You can basically just do back face culling or turn off show back face and fix that. Or. So you see the difference um, in terms of the effect. Or you can just go opaque and not have any blending for a solid glass object. All of this is a hack. Uh, in um, cycles, it'll just render automatically. None of these settings have any effect, and it'll just render correctly based on however the glass has created the object itself. But if you wanted to do some sort of transparency effect um, with refraction, and Eevee, these are the things that you play around with. Okay, um, so let's move on to non or uh, thin walled glass. So we'll hide this. Here's our thin walled glass. And this one's tricky for her because um, I'll show you the difference, but she's, she doesn't have an um, inner wall yet. So I'll show you how to do that. Let's do thin. So um, she, this is like thin walled glass. You can see it better in the sphere. And notice that when I select this, this is, I've added an extra shader. Um, 
which is this transparent BD, BSDF. I found through some experimentation that this just works better for thin walls. Um, the other thing is if you look at these objects, let's see if I've turned it off. I've got this solidify modifier on it with a very thin setting um, so that they um, have some edge or they're double walled. Okay. And I can increase that to change. And notice that when I do, I get this interior refraction and edge to it. Um, so you can see that. And now I've also rounded out the cube at this point so you can get this edge uh, details a little bit better to see them better. So the thickness, depending on the thinness of your glass walls, helps to allow you to see through. Because if I didn't, um, let's select the material, look at our settings here. If I turn off back face calling, I get that same artifacting. If I turn on sh turn off show back face, I'm back to this. You can see some specular highlights through it, but you don't get um, the full object or the full interior you don't you definitely don't see the interior of the object so um, turning on show back face helps to get this interior wall showing in the glass so you can see like for a jar or like a space helmet or whatever and the uh, screen space refraction also has an effect uh, in terms of the refraction depth so if I turn that down um, she gets some weird kind of blurry artifacting based on the light. And again, it's kind of this additive effect, but um, it's not too bad in terms of the refraction. It just looks better on these objects where I've got the interior hole. So let me add uh, for her, let's add that solidify. So notice that kind of changed the way it refracted suddenly. And now she looks much more like a jar or a blown glass object with these interior holes correctly, kind of get creating reflect for reflections inside, and you see the edges. So that's how you do like a thin uh, versus a solid glass object. Uh, and again, you have to kind of like figure out well what makes the glass look better if you're doing EV. You don't have to worry about it in cycles, but if you just want to render EV, so you're doing a space helmet on a cartoon character, um, then you uh, tweak your settings here, and here's what it would look like without that glass, that add shader going on. So the add shader too, we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec, basically is creating an additive effect, which is why I have this color toned down. If I go at it full wide, it's, too, it, it's, it's adding to the effect of the color of the glass. Uh, which I could tone down here to kind of bring it back. Um, but I still need, because it's additive, it's basically layer the, layering them on top, okay? So um, you have to kind of blend between the two to get the right effect, to get the effect of the glass you want. Um, and the reason that I'm doing this um, add shader here is because if I just do it by itself, it looks okay, but um, there's something kind of off about it. So in other words, let's see. So there's the effect by itself, but it looks like I'm not getting this edge here, right? Um, it looks like it's three quarters transparent. Uh, the sphere can be okay. Suzanne is kind of okay. But I just found that by blending between these two, doing this additive, it cleans up the edges a lot. Um, that I actually get this specular edge shown and the refraction shown right here. Um, and it just kind of looks better. It still renders, you know faster, or real time at least. Um, so anyway, that's um, thin wall of glass. Let's take and look at the next one, which is a bubble. And this one gets pretty complicated quick, but it's um, using everything that I've shown you so far. 
So let's take a look. So what's the difference between a thin walled glass and a bubble? It's basically the um, refraction of light on the surface of the bubble, depending on what it's made of. So um, bubble. Notice that when I add that, I get this kind of red, green, yellow um, blend across the surface of the object. And things tint that color when I look through them. So if I, let me turn on the glass. Uh, glass may not be the best. Let's do the next one. That one's already got the same effect. Do the one. Yeah. So these objects are kind of silvery by themselves, but when I look through them, uh, I get this refraction of uh, the color that I'm looking at through it. Okay, so the gist is, um, let me see, did I turn off her thin wall? Yeah. Let's add that uh, solidify. That helps. So the bubble, because it's also like thin wall glass, needs that um, solidify as well to create the proper um, edge effect. So if you look at this material, it's pretty straightforward. Again, I'm using this um, add shader. I've got a um, hue saturation val value going into color off of coming off of this base. You can see the colors that I'm choosing to add to the bubble. The trick is though, um, and this is based on a tutorial by CG Cookie, where he showed this. The problem was is that something's changed based on his his tutorial where he's creating this vertex curves and, and before he was just running this normal straight into the vector. If I do that straight in, um, I get the wrong effect uh, in terms of how the colors, like it's rotated off to the side. I get this stripe going across the bubble. Hopefully you can see that. You can see it in the sphere here. Um, what we can do is we can uh, crank up the value or the saturation so you can see the effect more. Um, so you're getting the, instead of the red centered on the camera looking at me, I'm getting the edge straight on. And that's because um, I needed this vector transform going from object to world pumped into the vector coming off of the normal in order to get things rotated so that the red looks straight at me and then the blues and greens and yellows play off the edge and then all that's going on here is I'm taking a noise texture a texture with some distortion and using this vector curves to create um, kind of a wavy look here uh, so that I can just tweak it's kind of like creating a um, a bump map on the object, but instead it's um, just distorting the output using this layer weight and this color ramp. Um, a Fresnel here, a layer weight color ramp running uh, into my hue saturation, which is where I'm just like, if I um, left it at default one, it was kind of too bright, or without it, this is what it looked like going in. And it was like too colorful. So I just ran it through this hue saturation and then took the saturation down to create a more subtle color effect. Um, and that's that for the bubble. Um, and then based on that, uh, you get similar effects uh, on pretty much any kind of chemically treated glass because what's causing this um, call it an oily um, reflection or refraction scattering color on the bubble is the idea that there's some sort of chemical in there that is refracting the light in different ways um, so you can and the same thing happens with um, blown glass so let me turn off the displaced objects here and turn on smoked glass I mean is here and this is a much easier way to see the effect so you could also do this for certain types of uh, minerals that have the same effect 
or even CD or CDs. You just have to scatter them differently. So if we take Evie, and, or uh, sorry, Suzanne, and change to smoked glass, you can see what's going on. Same effect as the bubble, almost the exact same setup. And all I'm doing is adding some, um, I'm running it also into subsurface color. So there actually is some subsurface uh, value coming through, which means I've turned on subsurface translucency here. And I've got the screen space refraction so that um, it lights from behind and creates some sort of uh, translucency and kind of scattering. And then, so you can easily see that it's glass and you can see the trans the uh, transparency through it, but you're also getting this um, color effect as we move around, which is all of the stuff that we did on the bubble. Um, and the uh, waviness is a little more subtle, so we could crank up the distortion to create more of a pattern. And that's how that works. So um, you can do all kinds of cool effects with this. It's similar to the whole car paint thing, just um, mapping a color ramp instead. So we could have taken, going back to the car paint, instead of blending two different things together, we could have just used this as a modifier and done a Fresnel effect where we were applying these types of um, iridescent effects to the the edges and letting the car paint shine through uh, straight on. Okay. Uh, I really like looking at that effect. You can do some really cool things with it. All right. Uh, and then the next is going to talk about how to change the shape of an object, which you can't do in Eevee. But you can do it cycles. So uh, we're going to talk about a displacement map. Let me change this material. To full displacement. And well, that's really interesting. It actually started to keep the color for a second. Um, and I want to take off this solidify because I don't need it anymore. It's just complicating things. So what I've done is I've created this kind of aluminum foil effect and again all I'm doing is taking a noise texture separating out one of its channels uh, running that through a color ramp using it as a roughness so that I get different um, metallic reflective properties, like some smooth, some rough. Notice that this looks really weird straight on, like that. And that's that's basically because um, I've got this displacement bump going on. Uh, but instead of running it in through the normal, I'm running it in through this vector displacement, taking this noise texture doing a combined XYZ, which is another node, it's a mathematical node, and I'm just running it into the Y, and then applying that as a vector or a height type of scale to this displacement node in the material output. And normally that would only show, so if we look at the material, we go down to settings, um, You don't get the option to see it here because it's not really an option in Eevee. But if you swap, and that's the other thing to understand is like these options change depending on your render output. So if we go and swap to cycles, let me make sure I'm not in render mode so because I don't want to slow the video down. So I just swapped over to material instead of rendered. Uh, so that if I go to cycles, now when I select the material, if I look at its um, output, I get a dis displacement option right here. So that right there lets you know that technically um, displacement is more of a cycles thing than an EV thing. Even though the bump did show up, it shows up weird. 
Um, but by default, it's going to be bump only, which is this. Right now, I'm set to displacement and bump. I want to set it to displacement and bump, or I could set it to displacement only. Um, but by setting it to displacement and bump, when I go and render now, you're going to see a big change in the way this stuff looks. So let's go to render mode. Everything shifts position. That's what displacement does, is it will uh, take the vertices and just shift them out based on this mapping that we're running into it. So um, now it looks kind of like a folded foil ball or whatever coming off of this, and that's the displacement effect. So that's what displacement does. Um, and I'll zoom in on this and show you. So you actually can create, you can use this to create like terrains and um, textures from textures or whatever. This isn't a great foil effect because it's too smooth and round, but I just wanted to sort of show you using the noise again, how that can work. So that's displacement. Now, let's go and look at the last. Let's combine all of this stuff together to create a tune shaded output. Um, let me select the material. And in this case, I want tune shade. Okay, this it's, it's not a great example. Basically, I'm using that same noise um, bump texture to create a kind of surface difference. The same thing I was using for the displacement, but I'm taking that and running it in. And I'm also using instead of a displacement now, I've turned it into a true bump, so that it actually affects the uh, renders as a light kind of effect. And if you zoom in, you can see where these dot patterns appear, like a moray effect across the surface. Probably easier to see on the um, edges of things that are round. So um, I'm adding that, basically using um, generating a, um, taking this magic texture, with it, which if we run straight into, actually not the magic texture, just the green of the magic texture. And actually I'll just do this. I'm modifying its darkness there. Run that into the surface. It's just creating this dot pattern, which changes because I am mapping it based on the camera. If I mapped it based on generated, I get this dot pattern mapped that way, but it stays with the object. Uh, and I kind of want these pat this to look equally toned across because it's like I want it to look 2D printed. So in order to do that, you have to basically map it to the camera or the window. If I map it to the window, it's going to be projected straight on. Uh, and I can scale that to create a different type of effect. So I'm just looking to create these this um, halftone dot pattern. See the Z one lot effect. It's and then once I plug this back into the shader output, it's gonna think about it. you can see that kind of halftone effect and all I'm doing is just limiting that effect using um, this mixer channel and a Fresnel right here this Fresnel making this be a mask Let me run that into the surface so you get this outline effect actually yeah no this Fresnel that's the outline itself. I'm creating like a, a tune outline. This for now is the mask for the um, dot pattern. So it's a thicker 
mask so that I'm including the colors that way. And I'm just mixing those using RGB mixers and combining everything right before it goes into the um, input. Notice it takes a while to calculate because I'm doing a lot of stuff here. And another thing to know is that this will not render uh, well at all in cycles. It's totally an EV effect. Uh, and I'm actually applying a lot of this stuff after the principal BSDF. So some people might be going, well, why are you using the principal BSDF? You could just use a diffuse or whatever. Actually, yeah, I could, but I'm relying on a lot of the um, normal map and material effects that I'm getting off that principle to create this variation in color. And how I'm creating that kind of variation is I'm splitting out, I convert the principal BSDF to a shader to, to RGB, so it makes it like an image, which will look like basically, this will hide everything in the effect. If I just run that. I get back my, um, essentially my um, foil effect, right? but now it actually works because um, I'm using a normal map instead of that, or it looks right from all angles because I'm using a normal map instead of the um, uh, displacement. I run that into this split uh, channel to RGB. And then I uh, run that through a color ramp, which will give me something like this. In grayscale. So it's sort of creating this um, drawn, sketched, more, uh, noir kind of look. And each one of these is a little different in terms of its ramp so that it will behave differently. And what I'm doing is I'm taking those, I split them off from RGB, I'm combining them again so that I run that into, before I apply the outline and everything else, uh, recombine them to get the combined um, gradient channels mixed back and that's what's giving me all this color difference where suddenly the, that image that was silvery colored or whatever becomes red and purple because I'm taking and mapping different gradients to it so if I disconnect one of them just the red and the blue Then I get sort of a purplish effect. If I go just the green and red minus the blue, I get an orange effect. And if I just do blue and green, it's thinking about it. That's just the green channel. If I do blue green, it'll blend because again these gradients are not the same to create uh, a mix between the two. And if you look at these, I'm still set at linear. Some people like to do uh, these as um, constants. And I'll show you how that works. Make sure we're back in EV so we don't have to do all this calculation. Because um, this, like again, this shader will not work and uh, it'll render just bright in uh, cycles. So let's go to constant on all of these. And. What I want to do is instead of using black, um, I can actually do kind of a gray on each one of these. I'm going to disconnect them now so that they won't update the output so I don't have to calculate. Hopefully this will not have to calculate. I 
All right, so now if we take this and make it grayish, this will make it go a little bit quicker. Different levels of gray. And something like that. Then we'll connect them back up. There's my red. Notice it's a lot more um, kind of graphic. The same thing when I add in the green. But there's going to be a slight mismatch because of where the gradients overlap or don't overlap. And the same with the blue. And on one of these, I may want to go to um, black. I may add like black in here. So let's add it on. Let's add it on blue. And see what happens. And then we start to get something. So yeah, actually, um, you need the black for the kind of like edge lighting, I guess, or the darkness, the shadowing. But uh, you need the grays for the graphic effect. And how much of that you get is dependent upon where you shift the sliders to. If they're all the same, they'll get their lighting, the color from the actual color of the lighting. But if you shift them and offset them, then you can create your own colors. Okay? So that's. Um, that and I was just taking that straight out so then when we add the uh, edge effects in you end up getting the outlines so hopefully this was helpful um, in terms of creating or playing around with the node editor to create your own materials um, I know this stuff can look a lot like spaghetti and like where to start now you should get the idea that basically you're playing around with the way objects or uh, textures map to things and then using color ramps to change um, how those things look in terms of contrast. Combining those using RGB effects and um, relying on shaders for uh, different, you know, how they, exp how they get rendered in the environment and then remapping that overall. Uh, so if you have any questions, post them uh, below in the comments, and I will link to all of these materials as they were originally shown when we started um, on my GitHub account. I'll have a link to those in the, com in the um, description. Uh, thanks for watching.